It's another episode of the Gauntlet Podcast. My name is Jason. Steve. Dan. You guys don't say my name is Steve and my name is Dan anymore. Well, oh. I just have to wing it based on what the second person says. No, that's says. a good point. That's a good <laughs> so, point. Like, yeah. I never know what's coming. Is this is this not our new thing anymore? <laughs> no, I, I just it's just an observation on my part. I was part. thrown off by Dan not giving us a countdown. That's true that's too. True. And then point yeah. You spent all that true. time mastering it. And I know, you, and but now you didn't like, do it. But now, like I've learned it, so I have <laughs> I have nothing more to gain from doing. So you were it. just doing it for self improvement, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed. But now that I'm a, like a professional finger counter uh there's really no reason for <laughs> have you me been to paid practice for that? my my craft wow. sounds really dirty for some reason <laughs> professional finger counter i don't know what that means i don't know why it sounds dirty but it just does all right as always we'd like to start by talking about the games we've been playing a uh, pretty short list this week mostly because we've been playing the same games over and over again the first one on the list here is a game called lost legacy is that a board game steve uh card game yeah card game uh, why don't you tell us so about it's it? by uh, cg can i of love letter fame and uh, somebody else as well but Somebody else who isn't Sage, you can I, so I don't remember. And it plays similarly for the most part. You, you, you know, everybody gets one card to start off, and on your turn, you draw a second one. But the way the game setup is a little different. You'll have a draw pile as normal, but then there's one card that is adjacent to the draw pile. That is called the Ruins. And there's a specific card. The cards are numbered sort of like in Love Letter, and you're looking for the number five card, the Lost Legacy. And uh, when I say looking for, I mean that's the end game goal. If people, you can still knock people out, as in Love Letter, but if there are more, if there's more than one person remaining by the time all the cards have been run through, then what you're trying to do is be the first person to find, openly find that number five card. And so at the end of the game, you go into the investigation phase. And you're, again, you're looking for that number five. And if you know where it is, so it, you might have it in your hand. You might have looked at another person's hand and know, and you might know that it's there. Or it might be in the ruins and you might be able to, uh, you might have looked at those. Okay. Or added to the ruins, like, here's the number five card, I put it in the ruins now, now there's two cards. But it's not just a matter of knowing where it is, because the cards, uh, the investigation phase goes in basically initiative order. If you have the number one card, that's probably a pretty good card that if you held on to it, you would have wanted to play it. So it's a bit of a sacrifice to hold on to it. But it will let you go... Early on in the uh, in the initiative phase, and if you know where the okay. number five Got card it. is, yeah. you'll be yeah. able to find it, turn it over, you win. Okay. Uh, of course, often enough, you're going into investigation phase not knowing where it is, and so having the one means you're just the first person to eliminate a possibility. But it's the the way the game functions until you get to the investigation phase. The investigation phase is the main difference uh, between that and love letter. But the way the cards play can differ depending on which version of the game you're playing. Because there's two compatible versions uh, that I have, I should say. I think oh, there's more than that. Okay. And when I say compatible, what I mean is you'll buy one set, and it'll have a one card and a two card and a three card and so on. And with the second set, you can switch out the numbers so long as you still come out with the same number of cards. So in other words, like if I, if I, I can keep the entire deck from set A – except for the three eight cards. And then I take those out, replace them with the other three eight cards, and suddenly it'll play a little bit. Oh, okay. I right. see, yeah. I see. Okay, yeah. yeah. And you, uh, I, I, I've played where we sort of mix things up randomly uh, from game to game, and it it adds to the... It's a, it's a lot of fun. I, I haven't actually given my opinion on it. It's a ton of fun. And if you buy multiple sets, it gives you a lot of uh, variability and replayability. Oh, okay. Huh. And... The, the two different sets that I have, I have the Starship and Flying Garden. You'll usually find them if you go to a game store in like the same place as Love Letter. And one of them is a little, a little more like it lets you look in, look in the deck and switch cards out and rearrange things and sort of reset somebody's discards and that sort of thing. The other one's a little more, uh, I get to look at your hand now. If you have the number five card, I win. Or I get to look at your hand now. If you have, a card that normally screws me over when I do that, I win. Hmm. Or I have the X card, which is uh, unrelated to John Stavropoulos' thing. I have the <laughs> X card. There's <laughs> one through eights and then Xs. Uh, the X is like if somebody looks at your hand, they're out of the game. You get their card now. That sort of thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's cool. Different yeah. Trump cards, that sort of thing. Anyway, I like so that. It's a lot of fun, and it's 10 bucks. you know. Yeah. Well, so um, if it's, it's by the designer, you said of Love Letter. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things I love about Love Letter is it's just – what is it? 18 cards or something. Yeah, and, something like and it's this really, really good, deep 
game, yeah. right? Um, same same thing. Like just yeah, pretty much. I I, I don't minim- like it as much design. as Love Letter. Okay, but it's you know eighty five percent. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Good to, good to know. Well, the next game on the list is Inigo Montoya Jr., which is a Goblin Quest hack, and that was you, Dan, so tell us about it. Yeah, this is uh, like Goblin Quest. You have five characters. You play them all one after the other as they inevitably die over the course of the quest. The setup is you all know this person who is slain by the villain, and in the beginning, you decide who the villain is and who the initial victim is. And like what each of your characters relationship to them is. And then, um, after doing this really great intro scene where they, the villain comes and like murders this dude and, uh, knocks you all out of the way and like scoffs at your attempts to stop him and, uh, murders <laughs> the, murders your friend in front of you. Uh, you all go into training for years and years and become sword masters and you make up your sword school and all of that. And, uh, then you go off on your quest for revenge. Uh, you will inevitably die. And then when you do, you have a new character and you roll like a new relationship to your previous character. And so then your new character is trying to avenge the death of your previous character and the original character. (laughs) And so you end up with a very long chain of characters. And um, at any point, each character can one time give the speech from the Princess Bride. Yes. <laughs> and But you have to go through the entire chain of characters. Say like, hello, my name is Blah. Uh, you killed my my father, Blah, and his rival, Blah, and his friend, <laughs> Blah, and uh, go through the whole thing. And it's like very high stakes because if you fuck up when you're giving the speech, your character just immediately dies in the most, <laughs> in the most violent and bloody way possible. So, uh, um, but it's a lot of fun. Like every other Goblin Quest hack yeah. that we've played, like hey, it's well, reliably fun. I've got a so. question for you to segue from that. So we've played Goblin Quest, obviously. We've played Kobold Quest. We've played Eagle Montoya Jr. I wasn't in that recent game, but I've played it before. Yeah. Um, we've played, uh, Regency Ladies, which is not really a hack, but, uh, you know, kind of sprung out of it. Which is your favorite? I'm going to disregard Regency Ladies because I don't think okay. that it should be compared it, yeah, to the rest yeah. of them. It's just in the book of the Goblin Quest. That's yeah. it at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I really like Inigo Montoya. I love the set, like the setup for it so much. And, uh, I would rather play like 17th century swordsmen than goblins in right, general. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't know. I, I like Inigo Montoya, I think, but cool, cool. They're all really good. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, was the is, is final revenge achievable? Did you guys succeed? We did. Yeah, yeah. And at the okay. end, the way you do the end thing is like you've sort of decided initially. You just make up facts about the villain, and these are the clues that you know. And then uh, each each fact informs where you go for one scene. So one scene was like. He's an expert pianist. And so then you're like, okay, well, how does this help us find him? And so then we went to a piano contest in Vienna or something to track him down. But then at the end, you loop it all together and you're like, all of these facts uh, we've discovered through our investigation that they're all related to like this dastardly plot. And the murder of this dude was only like one small piece of this huge plot. And so then you have to stop the villain's like big overall like goal. I think both times it was kind of nonsensical. Uh, like, <laughs> right. Because yeah, you're, yeah. you're trying to connect really completely disparate facts. But it's always ended up being really satisfying. I think this time we had to, uh, he was trying to murder Mozart in order to start a <laughs> war between some countries. I don't know. But the end result was like, we uh we knocked him out of a hot air balloon and he fell on Mozart's piano in the middle of like the concert and died. And <laughs> That's great. So that was great. Uh, nice, nice. Cool. Well, the next games on the list are two flavors of Dungeon World. Um, you might imagine of the three of us, that's me. We have uh we played the third session of our Saturday morning uh hangouts games. A reminder to listeners, we have this new hangouts community and we've been running I've been running this thing called Saturday Morning Cartoons. It is Dungeon World at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Um, <laughs> uh, it is great. Uh, I'm really loving it. We're running it in my Dagger Isles campaign setting, and that's something I've run for Houston Gauntlet, the face-to-face you know, gauntlet. 
probably god at least 50 or 60 sessions in it right it's a little late a little bit of laziness on my part because i'm just kind of reusing a lot of my adventures from <laughs> that houston's already seen ah, that's fair but you know whatever um you know remixing it here and there but um but the cool thing is is we've got i've got brand new players there are people who i you know never met except for david that i've never met you know prior to to this experience and so it's kind of fun to see how they're reacting to these things that I'm so familiar with, you know, and how they're kind of like putting their own uh, spin on things. All of them are really embracing like the lore building aspects of, of dungeon world and, and particularly the way I run dungeon world. And so I'm really loving that too. Um, it's going great. I, I'm, I'm quite, quite happy with it. <sighs> then the other dungeon world thing is I, speaking of all these dungeon world sessions for Houston, I've run my final sessions of dungeon world, uh, for Houston. It was a series of sessions I called the horrors of House of Olgon. It was kind of a, um, haunted mansion. Well, ultimately it was kind of a haunted mansion thing, but, um, it was a grand total of three sessions, three sessions spread out over. Or I should say 20 hours spread out over three sessions. Jesus. Um, oh, man. <laughs> is that right? Oh, no, I have that wrong. 16 hours. 16 hours spread out over, uh, three sessions. That's I'm not, a little better. I'm not that crazy. Yeah, Come yeah. on. And, uh, it was great. Uh, it was, it was loads of fun. Uh, you know, it obviously has like a, a little twinge of sadness because I know that I'm not going to be running Dungeon World anymore for, for our Houston group, but, uh, it was great fun. It was a good kind of like go out with a bang kind of thing. I was trying to do the math and, I think I've run 175 sessions of Dungeon World. Jesus. Yeah, I believe that. For, for the Gauntlet, for Houston Gauntlet. Yeah. Or, or just in Houston in general. Um, so yeah. So these were the last ones. <laughs> these were, these were the final, <laughs> uh, the final ones. Um, so, uh, but it was great fun. Uh, I really loved it. So the next game on the list is One Night. Oh, actually, can I go back to my Dungeon World thing? Oh, too late. No, I am. Um, so I wanted to say that, uh, I still have, I constantly try to like have, uh, new tricks, uh, despite the fact that I run so much Dungeon World. And one of the things I did in this series was the, each, the face to face houseful going. The, the, the houseful yeah. going, yeah. Uh, so one of the things I did in this series, which was a little different, um, was each of the three sessions had, uh, they took inspiration from horror movies, uh, different horror movies. And so the first session took inspiration from Evil Dead. And, uh, the whole session was principally, uh, took place in a farmhouse, um, Ooh. in a single room of a farmhouse. Oh, so evil Dead, Evil Dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the main thrust of the, of the session took place and, 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 and the climax of the session, uh, took place in the, in just this one room of a farmhouse with the characters basically going crazy, uh, and killing each other. And, uh, it was great fun. Uh, so, so unusual from how we normally do Dungeon World. And I really loved it. How do you, how do you handle that in Dungeon World? Well, it's surprisingly easy because, you know, I think if you're doing a good job as the GM, you're asking, you're spending lots of time asking questions and so, you know, after describing like, you know, sort of like what the characters are seeing and hearing and feeling, you just go around the table and say like, you know, well, what are you thinking right now? Or how are you, how are you feeling about this? Or, you know, and then there was, um, there was a series of like, there was a countdown clock basically involving this, um, this supernatural entity that was causing the characters to become paranoid with fear. Right. Mm. And so as that counted down, like it, everything just started escalating and building into, and, and, and you kind of, and it, it, it gets like, who's going to snap? Like, who's going to be the one to like finally, fail you know and, and trigger the really bad stuff right so uh it, it was cool the, the, everybody really loved it even even though like you know, most of the characters died but um <laughs> but but everyone seemed to love it they thought it was appropriate um the second uh the second session was inspired by uh wicker man um involving uh, a well, crazy cult crazy well, I ha- I crazy nature ask. cult yeah uh original or nicholas cage uh, original i've never seen the nicholas cage one okay. so yeah it was original <laughs> yeah it was super hippy dippy you know yeah. like like you know style like nature cultists um and then the final one was uh mostly just a pastiche of, of haunted house movies so okay yeah i'm oh, sorry just wanted to say that um yeah, that's fun the next game on the list is one night ultimate werewolf we have talked about that last week but uh St- i know steve you've been playing it a lot <laughs> uh, i've been playing it a lot too i i'm mm, i think i've played somewhere between like 45 and 55 games in the last month <laughs> yeah, it's been a lot <laughs> yeah. I, 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 just me in the last in the last two weeks i would say it's got to be at least 20 or 30 games, yeah. you know, at least. Yeah, I mean, you know, cause you were there for most of the, for most of the, or all yeah. of them, I think. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. You haven't played with, uh, outside of that? No, I have not. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. That's still a ton. Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah, I know. It's, uh, needless to say, it is a lot of fun. 
Uh, so you you described it last uh, last uh, last we, time we did, around, we mecha- so. Yeah, we did a yeah. mechanical thing last week, so people should check that out if they want to know. Uh, but it's so I have the expansion now, uh, Daybreak, which is standalone, but I've been incorporating it into the the base set and mixing things up. What I, what I really like about the game is that your strategy for it will be completely different depending on how the cards turn up and how how the round goes. So you'll <laughs> we will frequently start off a game and. There's just like 10 seconds of silence as everybody's like, mm, do I speak first? What do right. I say? Do, do I lie? Do I tell the truth? What do I lie about? Uh, because even if you're not the werewolf, you, well, you might not know you're the werewolf or not the werewolf. And you might not know if, uh, somebody else is lying, trying to out you, whether or not they're the werewolf. And yeah, it, all sorts of horrible lies. And, uh, I, I love the feeling when, <laughs> love slash hate the feeling when and this has happened like two or three times i'm i'm pretty sure i have played the whole table and wrapped them around my little finger <laughs> right, and uh, then yeah. the cards get uh get flipped over and i'm like wow i had no I had, fucking I totally idea what was going up, on. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh it, it, it's been a ton of fun and i've played it with like probably 15 people 15 different people yeah yeah, yeah yeah you you had to have played way more than 50 games yeah, maybe so. Yeah, I think you, yeah. Had, you, you had to. Have, I feel like I've played like a dozen. Yeah, or so, yeah, yeah. Just the, just and I've only played it once. Yeah, that one so. time with Dan, we played, we played for like at least five hours Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah, friends. we've. Yeah. yeah, it's you've probably played it a hundred times. You don't realize it. I mean, I'm serious. I'm serious. <laughs> it's possible. I'm yeah. serious. Yeah, I haven't been keeping track, but it's. Uh, and that means one way or another, I've definitely played that game more than I've played any other tabletop game. Uh, well, uh, non role playing tabletop. We should game. point out that it's very fast. Yeah, you, yeah. you know, that, like the it's like. 10 minutes sometimes yeah. or five to 10 minutes, depending on how the conversation goes. So some, some rounds just don't go your way. And right, it's like, Oh yeah. crap on the werewolf. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But it, even with, even if you have a bunch of specialized roles in the game, uh, I, I don't remember if you guys mentioned the helpful app or not. Oh, we but, did. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. Um, yeah. The app that kind of manages it all, right. the narration and stuff. Even yeah. if that takes like a minute and a half to run through, it's still a really quick fire game and you're engaged the whole time. Unlike normal werewolf will, where you'll get eliminated and you get to sit on the sideline, sideline silently for, what did you, you say last minutes. time, Dan? Like, uh, Chuck hasn't said shit the whole time. So I don't know what his right, deal is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck just said he was a villager, villager and then just sat there. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. One night's awesome. Uh, tons of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, so good. Um, the next game on the list and we're just about done. The next game on the list is fiasco. I got a chance to play a th- another three player fiasco. I'm increasingly liking three player fiasco. I have to say, <laughs> uh, you know, we've always played it like with four and, but lately I've been doing it with three and there's something about the closeness and immediacy of a three player fiasco that is very, very appealing to me. And so, uh, we played a very, very traditional, I think it was like the, the first, the first play set in the red book was the one we did. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't remember which one it is. It's one of the like town, suburban, suburban yeah, yeah. ones. Yeah. Or main street or something like that. And very Cohen brothers. Yeah. Yeah. We did. Uh, that, that standard kind of initial play set. Uh, we had a brand new player, a player who's never even played a role playing game. Oh yeah. Hmm. And, um, he, wanted to originally get into role playing games because of Dungeons and Dragons, which is normal and, and, and expect- common. common. Certainly. Um, but he decided to come out anyway to our, uh, to one of our meetups and he had an amazing time. Like he had such a blast. Like when it was over, he just couldn't stop talking about how much fun he had. And, and, and rightfully so. It was probably one of the best games of fiasco I've done. As much as I love all the different playset options for fiasco, I have to say fiasco shines brightest when you're just doing like dumb criminals doing yeah. dumb shit right yeah. like that is that is truly the best way to experience fiasco and um and yeah we had a great game it was awesome everybody was hitting their character beats um it, it was it was so good like you, it's one of those man this couldn't have gone better and especially with a new player like it's you're really yeah, it's, it's yeah, really yeah. satisfying when you have a new player and it goes so well so um he's trying to come to our wednesday game again but he's on the wait list right now so um <laughs> i may have to try to find a way to 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 get him off the wait list but uh but anyway so yeah fiasco and then that's, sh- that just leaves our last game, uh, which is Dead of Winter, uh, which is a board game. Dead of Winter, uh, shall I set it up or do you want to? Uh, yeah, yeah. You, okay. You um, so we've, uh, there's this board game called Dead of Winter. It's by Plaid Hat, which is most known for Mice and Mystics, I think yeah, was their first so game. It is a game about zombies in like a snowy, 
Midwest town, I guess, um, which is the whole dead of winter. Get it? Um, I didn't get it at first until it was explained to me by Dan. (laughs) (laughs) After I'd like had it for forever, he was like, you know, he's like, oh yeah, dead of winter. I was like, oh shit. (laughs) Um, so yeah, dead of winter. I'm, I'm dumb. Like just sometimes I'm really (laughs) stupid. All right. So it is a cooperative. It's kind of a cooperative slash competitive board game, which is it's kind of unique in that way. I think I can't think of other games that do that. Can you? Um, hmm. maybe not in quite the same way. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of there are lots of cooperative games that have like a trader mechanic, you know, yeah. like Shadows Over Camelot or, or, or Battlestar. But this one, you can have a trader as well. Uh, you, you have this colony you're trying to. Uh, your colony has like an overall colony goal. It usually involves it's some form of like trying to get samples to find the cure for the zombieism or trying to, you know, collect zombie bodies for research or just trying to clear out a bunch of zombies or whatever. Right. Um, you have this colony goal, but then each of the players has their own secret goal as well. <coughs> so you're trying to cooperate to the extent that you're, tr- you, that you're trying to get the colony goal complete because you usually can't complete your secret goal until you complete the colony goal. Yeah. And then you have your secret goal and that's what you actually have to do to win. So everyone is like trying to, everyone is generally cooperating, but you might not be cooperating quite like you should be because you may need to hold that medicine in your hand or you may need right. to not, you know, spend that food, even though it'd be good for the colony because right. you need that food to complete your secret objective. Right. And so, um, so it's got this nice, it's a really, really lovely, uh, balance between, you know, it's, 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 you get all the, all the pleasures of a cooperative game with like just enough competitive, uh, in there to make it, uh, interesting. So, yeah. um, and there's also a betrayer thing as well. So. And yeah, the, so the betrayer role is optional. There's just a chance that it's in the game, in any given game. And so, especially when somebody starts doing something fishy to further their individual win conditions, right? Yeah, you don't know if that is if that's the case or if they're just trying to screw you because they're right. The, yeah, uh, they're, uh, they're the traitor. Um, I, I think maybe Archipelago, the board game, not the role playing game, functions in maybe not quite the same way, but it's like got individual. I guess I've win never goals. played that one. Yeah. Um, so can two people get their secret goals and both win? Yes. Or yeah. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. second game I played, everyone individually won. Yeah, we all lost the first time right. with a betrayer. The betrayer and the non-betrayers lost. Yeah. And then the second... Oh, so the, be- the betrayer can lose as well, even if the players lose? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, because see what happens is um, often... Well, so I've been the betrayer like twice out of the three games I've played and both times I got exiled from the colony. So, so my group of like every player doesn't just control one character. They control like a group of characters, like their little faction within the colony. Right. And I got, uh, you get exiled if you are too obvious about being the betrayer, which is, which is going to happen if you're not familiar with the mechanics and you're, so you're making dumb mistakes. Right. And that's what, that's, that's what I'm chalking it up to anyway. And, um, so I got, so when you, but when you get exiled, your, your objective changes. So you stay in the game. Your people can't go to the main colony anymore. They have to hang out at like the library or whatever, some other, <laughs> some other like, you know, satellite place. Um, but their objectives change. And sometimes the objectives like redeems them. Like they're trying to like okay. get back in and help the colony again, uh, for whatever reason. Or sometimes it just, they just, they just change their objective entirely to something else. And so, yeah, you can absolutely lose as the betrayer as, you know, um, you know, or you can, or you can also lose as a betrayer in a more, I suppose, in a more mundane way by just not meeting one of the requirements of your objective, right? Because so, okay, yeah. it's not just like make the colony fail. It's usually make the colony fail and also collect 10 fuel or something like that. I right? got you. So, okay. Yeah, it's great. What do you think about it, Steve? Uh, so I, I'd been wanting to play for, well, probably about a year because I think it was first they had an initial release at Gen Con and got sold out immediately, released again. Sold all out all the very important yeah. gamers get their copies right, right, right. Yeah, at Gen Con. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I'd, I'd been looking forward to it for a long time. Um, and I was, uh, I, I left impressed. I especially like the crossroads mechanic, which I think Platt yeah, I didn't mention that, yeah. will be incorporating into future games. And anyway, so crossroads, basically when one player takes their turn, the player to their right, uh, draws a card off a huge stack of crossroads cards. And that will, that card will have some like trigger conditions on it. And the person who's looking at the card keeps an eye out for those things happening during the other player's turn. And if they do, then that triggers the event on the card, which is, which is basically fiction with a little bit of mechanics. It's like tied fiction to it. with some mechanics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it adds a ton of uh, flavor and a ton of theme and it ties into the story very nicely. Yeah. Do they trigger very often? 
about a quarter of the time. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Yeah. And so sometimes you'll you'll be staring at a really awesome one that won't quite happen, like right. the like the fun cannibalism one we had oh, last time. It would yeah. be go- it would be podcast malpractice to not mention that. Do you, <laughs> do you remember how it went? It was so funny. It was it was something like, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's Earl. I know you don't like him. I don't like him either. No, I'm sorry. That's Fat Earl. I know you don't like <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah, there was a cheap fat joke in there. I don't like yeah, him either. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, his, his mama was a good woman, and I promised her to uh, I'd always take care of him. And then you have a choice. The The player whose turn it is has a choice. They can either take Fat Earl into the colony, in which case all of our food supplies get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap fat joke. Right. Good. Or, I don't remember how they word it, but it's like, or otherwise, uh, they can not take Fat Earl in, and then morale goes down one. And then it, it has a little snippet of uh, a monologue from the original character who's like, Who's uh, sobbing while eating a sandwich and saying, always with me, always He's with eating me. like a pulled pork or barbecue right, sandwich. Right. right yeah. <laughs> Not so, quite pork. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so like the eat fat Earl. Anyway, it, it was funny. Um, the it's fiction gives you a nice little choice. It's awesome. Yeah. It's really so cool. good. The um, yeah, the, the, it's, it's, it's a cool it's a cool feature of the game. I can't decide which of the numerous characters are my favorites. I've got it down to three. Okay. <laughs> I've got it down to three. I, I know what one of them is. Sparky the Sparky the dog. Of course. Sparky the stunt dog. He's a golden retriever with a red cape. <laughs> and uh he's uh he's amazing. He can somehow shoot shotguns. They never that's never explained in the fiction, yeah. but uh <laughs> and, and he's a stunt he's dog. He's a stunt dog. So, yeah. I mean. There's one gruesome crossroads where you make Sparky into a suicide bomber, though. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh my god, oh, Sparky. Uh Sparky's pretty cool. Just because he looks like so stupid and happy on his little picture yeah. and like during the you you know, it's like the middle of the zombie apocalypse. Um, he's awesome. And then, uh, or between, it's between Sparky, a forest plum, who is the drunk mall Santa, go, yeah. who has the very best special ability in the whole game. He's a drunk mall Santa. Uh, his special ability is if he wanders off into the snow and leaves the game, morale of the colony goes up. <laughs> love it it's so good, good. Yeah. it's good uh and then um the final one is gabriel diaz that's who you were oh. thinking yeah gabriel no no I, I was thinking of sparky oh okay oh gabriel diaz but now i, I know firefighter gabriel diaz oh boy let me tell you i know it's it's the height of uh or maybe the the the, the pits if you prefer of social uh degeneracy to to be uh physically attracted to drawings but <laughs> man oh man let me tell you, it would be so worth being caught in a burning building during the zombie apocalypse if if firefighter Gabriel Diaz was there to rescue you. Just saying. So. All right. Noted. <laughs> also, he's he's pretty capable, isn't he? Uh, he is. He's a good character yeah. too. Yeah. In addition to being incredibly smoking hot, smoking hot. He. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just let it pass. Thank you. No. Uh, he uh, he's he's a good character as well. So. Yeah. Oh, and um, all the characters have uh, like this influence score, which is like their influence in the colony. Like, so like the mayor has the highest. Like the sure. second is like yeah. a sheriff. Uh, I, th- I think Gabriel's actually the third. And that's just because he's a smoking hot firefighter. Um, <laughs> the very lowest is uh, is Sparky the dog because he's a dog. Okay. Right. But just barely above him is is Forrest Plum, the right. dog mall Santa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, don't know. I love that. Uh, it's great. Um, Dead of Winter. Anything else to say about it? Uh, no, I'm I'm a big fan, and I, I people should find it and ch- is check it out. Yeah, it's so I, was, cool. I was there contemplating buying it, but it I, it occurred to me I'd either be playing it with you, you own it, or my my friend who won't play anything zombie related because it's uh, overload. I'm like, oh, oh, crap, yeah. I have no excuse to buy this. But you know, it's the zombie the zombie part of it doesn't stick out to me. Which I think if you're if you're kind of over zombie stuff, this that shouldn't be an, a hindrance. It's it doesn't really like read zombie game like the, like the, the cool stuff is the is the other stuff that's happening in my opinion but, yeah, I mean, yeah that's true but also it's a 60 dollar. that's true yeah 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 fair <laughs> enough fair enough all right okay, cool um well let's take a break and then go to the next segment our next segment is giving me life this is where we discuss things that are not necessarily related to role-playing games that are giving us life this week so steve what's giving you life this week so going into today, I did not have uh, like I, w- I wasn't sure what I was you know going to say for the giving me life segment, and then I encountered a uh, an interesting thing I'd never seen online, which was this uh, YouTube video of a guy basically dissolving a ton of salt as much as it would take into water, and then plopping a d twenty in the middle of it 
and then poking at it so that theoretically it would come up with a different side every time. And he's basically testing it for balance, right? And huh. this this sounds like witchcraft. Right, right. I was super skeptical going in, uh, and I'm like, okay, this this sounds like crap. And then at a certain point, he picks up a die and he goes, oh, this one's really bad. This is my daughter's die. He plops it in, and he uh, it, it comes up a four. He pokes at it, comes up a four again. Uh, and this happens another time or two. And then it, it, uh, it comes back up as a, a face next to the four. It, it is, it is straight up the face next to the four. And then it, and it stops and then it switches. It just blatantly. Wow. A ghost moves the thing to a four and it. Wow. <laughs> huh. And this guy goes so far as to like, uh, cut open D20s and show you the bizarre crap. <laughs> this is such nerdy shit. Yeah, I love yeah, it. Oh my God. Um, so it's, uh. So does, does the dice like, does it like float in the water? Is that the idea? It, it does. Like They're, making the density the same between the water and the dye or uh, something? It, mm, uh, most of the ones I've tested will float, but okay. some of them won't. And I think I need like Epsom salt and there. He has an alternate method for the heavier ones. <laughs> of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, get so, a big so, jug of mercury and <laughs> your dice in. Ooh, that actually that sounds kind of fun. <laughs> the, yes. Yeah, so the, the, the see through dice. You can't really get away with there being bubbles and inconsistencies in there because you'll you'll see them. Uh, right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so those are usually of uh, better quality, and in my experience, I oh, think, and hence more expensive, right? Yeah, 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 like the the game science type thing. But if you if you've got a Chessex swirly pretty die, ninety uh, percent chance that thing is is screwed up. So I, I was, wow, and that's what all my dice are. I know mine oh, too, man. Uh, so I was I was messing around with all the dice I could you know get my hands on today. <laughs> with with the intention of being like, okay, I, maybe I can mention this on the podcast. And yeah, it's a lot of fun and kind of disappointing because I think I came up with one D20 that was pretty balanced or and is a swirly die. You know you know what dice have awesome balance? The crappy falling apart um tiny little dice that came in the original like D D box sets that you have to huh, fill huh. in fill in the numbers with a crayon. Oh, yeah, oh wow. Yeah. 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 Huh. Those are awesome. But the, yeah, seriously, everything was like, and this one's a, this one's a 17. Wow. Or, that's interesting. Or maybe huh. it'll be, uh, it'll tend toward a certain hemisphere of the, of yeah, the die. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, I did find a, a cheater die. I found one that tends toward a 20. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I was, I was really disappointed because I'd heard that, uh, dice companies don't really care so much about the, uh, the polyhedrals that aren't D6s because people aren't going to notice really. Mm, okay. And then they'll devote more attention to the sixes. And so the sixes I paid attention to, I have two sets of, uh, 2D6. Yeah. That I got from a, uh, convention last year at a friend's place. Tested them. Three of them are sixes. They tend towards sixes. And the other one will roll anything but. Hmm. But yeah, it's a really enlightening slash disappointing look at, uh, <laughs> how dice are made. Hmm. And, very, uh, very interesting. Yeah. All the, all the opaque, Solid color ones I tested were, aside from the crappy D&D ones I mentioned, were too heavy. So I, I haven't been able to test them yet, but I'm uh, expecting that to go a little bit better. Hmm. So it's just the pretty ones, the pretty swirly ones. That yeah. Are, the, yeah. The one, it, it's just the ones I love. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Really right. disappointing. That's but, what you get for using dice that aren't a single color. All right. of my dice are one color. Oh, yeah. Like, easy D- to no, read. Yeah. Dan judges us constantly on this <laughs> at games because his dice are, are are solid, opaque, easy to read dice. And they ours are. are ours are just pretty yeah. hard to read dice. Point Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Take that with you, Dan. And treasure I it will, and love it. Yeah. Going right in my pocket. <laughs> okay, cool, Dan. Uh, Dan, what's giving you life this week? Just super briefly, uh, one thing is... I was gonna do like a little VR minute update thing because I got to I got to use the uh, HTC Vive. It's becoming kind of your thing. Oh, did you? Yes. Oh yeah. How was it? Uh, it's fantastic. Okay. I was in Chicago during the Vive World Tour that's going to three so countries. It is, it's not Vive. No, it's Vive. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> confirmed. Confirmed. Yes. Or all the HTC people are wrong because they were calling it the Vive. So <laughs> anyway, it's awesome. Beyond that, the hotel we were staying in. I'm just turning this into a general tech I like thing. Uh, the hotel we were staying in has a Tesla. And if you want to go anywhere within two miles, you can just be like, hey, why don't you give me a ride in the Tesla? Wow. So huh, that's cool. We get to ride in this Tesla. It is like creepy because the dude like just guns it at stoplights. <laughs> and it'll like it'll like knock you back in your seat, but it's dead silent. So wow. it's the weirdest thing. Uh, really yeah. strange. Uh, yeah, it is, a, it is an experience yeah. just riding in it. But uh, huh. so anyway, that's my tech update. But the thing that's really giving me life is 
long form improv. It's kind of the same thing as when I talked about on a podcast a long time ago about Mark Major uh, putting on LARPs. Oh, LARPs yeah. in Austin. On stage yeah. in yeah. Austin. So it's a, it's a similar thing, right? Where it's a show that is anywhere from like an hour to two hours long mm-hmm. and uh, completely improvised, just made up on the spot. So there's two guys, they're TJ and Dave, and that's the name of their show. And they've been doing this show in Chicago for like, I don't know, forever. Uh, the little blurb about it says it's the longest running two-man improv show in the world. That's probably true. Uh, they have a documentary that I saw a long time ago called Trust Us, This Is All Made Up. And it's really good. <laughs> and it just goes into like, it just kind of follows them around as they're like preparing for the show. And when they do this show, they do it once a week. And when they do it, they go on stage. It's the two of them and three chairs. And that's the only wow. thing on stage. Huh. They have no idea what they're going to do or anything. Uh, nice. And it just like blew my mind. They are so good at this. I was expecting it to be like awkward and weird initially, but with them, not even that. Just from the word go, they were on and amazing. And like the way they can juggle things in the scenes. So they would have scenes with more than two characters in them. So, uh, but they both have everything down. So like the, they, you can tell they have a really good idea of where everything is on the set. And so they will look to characters that aren't there and (laughs) things like that and like respond as if they, as if they had said something and respond in a way that makes it obvious what the, what the character who isn't there said. So they don't play more than two characters. Well, they do. But, um, and so if they need to, one of them will jump to that character and will just move to that part of the stage and pick up (coughs) as that character. But the way they're able to juggle all of these things was amazing. So, uh, just an example, one of the scenes was they had one character on the phone. So they were at one end of the stage talking to another character on the phone at another end of the stage. <laughs> they were yelling downstairs in their house to another character who was talking to another character in that room. So there are four characters <laughs> spread over three locations. Nice, nice. And like it was completely obvious uh, every time that. It, they needed to switch like they were already there one of them had already jumped into the character but like and but they're also super good at just like implying what was said and responding to something that yeah, you didn't hear yeah wow what a talent jeez yeah yeah oh it's amazing yeah. i felt like salieri and amadeus like <laughs> it was just pissing me off like how good these guys were um but just to point out actually uh if either of you have watched tv in the last 10 years you probably know who tj is oh tj miller TJ Jagodowski, oh. who is the the funny guy from the Sonic commercials. The two dudes in their cars, like talking about oh, Sonic food. I'm vaguely familiar with yeah. that. Yeah. He is yeah. he has been doing like Sonic commercials for years and years. Uh, okay. Um, uh, if I if I saw a picture, I'm sure. Yeah, you probably would recognize him. For our listeners who are not uh based in uh our part of the country, Sonic is uh, a nasty drive in. The food that is, is pretty much national. I oh, think. is it now? I think oh, so. Okay, I was I thought it was still fairly regional, but I don't know. Not. I mean, a dude from Chicago know. does the commercials. Well, that's fair, so. but it used to be pretty regional, though. Like, no, it used maybe. to be you could only find them in like Oklahoma and Texas, and gotcha. like, that was it. I don't but, know. but anyway, so TJ and Dave, fucking amazing. If you're ever in Chicago on a Wednesday night, go see their show. Like, I don't care what else you had going on, <laughs> don't do it. Go see their show. So I was so pumped up about that. And like my wife was really into it too. So we went back to the theater the next night and saw an improvised Shakespeare play. Sweet. Nice. Whoa. Which is also, which was also super impressive saying everything like lots of, lots of like spontaneous rhyming verses and stuff wow, like that. That's and, crazy. Uh, wow. Yeah. Like just an excellent <clears throat> job of keeping all of the threads going and having like, again, like tons of characters, uh, very, they didn't do nearly as much switching in the middle because there were five of them, so they didn't have to. But like tons of characters, they were all playing multiple roles and uh, just actually made a coherent plot out of the audience suggestion, which was Purple Rain Man for the name of the play. Wow. So there were a lot of <laughs> Prince references. Some of them went over my head, but uh, I got enough of them. And then the audience would laugh and I'd be like, oh, okay, Prince reference, I guess. So yeah. <laughs> it would have been, I would have preferred a few less Prince references, honestly, but the ones I caught were pretty funny. So I've assumed that the rest of them were very clever were pretty too. Good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't really know what to expect from these. Like, cause I'm the improv I'm more familiar with is certainly shorter form. Right. Uh, are they aiming for comedy or drama or both? Well, I mean, they're aiming for like the TJ and Dave one. It was funny throughout, 
because I think they're just funny dudes, right? Mm-hmm. You can tell that they would just be funny people. But the story they were telling weren't wasn't especially funny in its own right. Yeah. Like, but it had a very yeah. cohesive arc. And like at the end, it was like you could look back and be like, oh yeah, that <laughs> dude was the main character based on the arc that they went through. But like, you know, in the beginning, who knows? There's just a bunch of characters doing stuff. So they're kind of just being entertaining in the moment. And then the plot sort of forms Develops, as it goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think they put a little more thought into the Shakespeare ones, probably. But I would love to be like... The TJ and Dave one was just an hour straight. They take no breaks or anything. Uh, mm-hmm. There's no there's no scene cuts or anything. The scenes all flow. It's like it's like watching a movie that's shot with one take. Oh, right? okay, like, sure. The yeah, camera yeah. follows a character into the next scene. So like one character will leave the scene and come into and come in again, and the other guy will be playing someone different, and then it's like yeah, the next okay. scene starts from there. I would love to see like during the break because the Shakespeare one there's a break halfway through, so it's like a two act thing. I would love to like see how much they cooperation they do behind the scenes to like oh uh, to kind of like yeah, make sure yeah. we tie up all of these loose ends, loose ends because yeah. everything was tied up like brilliantly yeah, so i'd love yeah. to know how much actual like mid-session prep happens you can't but, fault them for it, though it's still impressive i mean oh, Jesus yeah, no, Christ. it's amazing yeah, like yeah. uh i mean they got the title for the play and the dude opened with like this soliloquy about per- the purple rain man right <laughs> so, like, <laughs> nice. all rhyming like just wow, on the that's spot. crazy it's that's so crazy blew my mind yeah so awesome anyway uh i don't think there's anything like that in houston i'm gonna look and see but i don't expect there is but yeah that was probably my favorite thing about chicago is just the fact that that exists yeah, Chicago uh, has a huge improv. It really does. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my giving me life is so one of the funny things about the Gauntlet is we okay. So we play lots of games. We game multiple times a week. We um we have special like themed gaming days. You know, based on holidays, we do all this kind of stuff. Uh, we're very public. We're very aggressively public. Like we we have new people show up constantly, and uh, you know, some of them stick around, some of them don't. But we but they they come, they try it out, they do their thing. Despite all of that, we are remarkably insular as a community, I think. Um, not many of us go to conventions that I'm aware of. Uh, we, you know. And if you were aware, you would disapprove. I would disapprove. <laughs> True. <No. yeah. laughs> well, I would have disapproved. Um, <laughs> I, we, we don't really go to conventions. We, we don't really go, we don't really get involved as far as I'm, as far as I know, we don't really get too involved in like role playing game forums uh, apart from our own. We just tend to like find these games, we play these games, and then we talk about the games amongst ourselves. But I'm really enjoying the past this year, uh, the past like few months, especially because the podcast has helped us kind of like reach parts of the gaming community that we've never like sought out before, <laughs> you know, like, sure, like, like yeah. we're having communications with like, you know, game designers who we've been playing their games forever, their games forever. Right. And we've never thought to like, you know, drop them a line or anything, you know, and, and just other people who do podcasts and like uh, just people from other parts of the country, the hangouts thing is doing the same thing. Um, I'm doing it kind of by necessity because I will not be in Houston for much longer. And so I've got to start like, you know, finding other people to game with, whether that's online or whatever. And so um, the thing that's giving me life is just spreading my gaming wings so to speak uh you know i'm i'm leaving the safe the safe nest of the gauntlet where everybody agrees with me and uh (laughs) spreading my wings and and diving off like a like a baby bird hoping to take flight or something i don't know it was a terrible (laughs) metaphor horrible (laughs) metaphor but um anyway that's it It it's a short thing i just want to say i'm really kind of digging that i i I, you know i I might even go to gen con next year i'm thinking about it Ooh, you'd be a lot closer yeah Uh, yeah i'll be i'll be a lot closer and i'm I'm definitely thinking about it i'm thinking you know just that could be a thing to do um i don't know you could go to pax PAX east yeah yeah exactly i could yeah yeah yeah. i don't know what that is but that's 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 okay great awesome yeah yeah um i just know you love penny arcade oh that's right it was a penny arcade that's right the penny arcade one yeah 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 Yeah, they're those guys (laughs) um (laughs) So anyway, uh, yeah, that's all I got to say. I just, you know, I'm really, I'm really loving it. I'm really, I'm really quite enjoying like all of the, um, you know, all of the feedback we're getting from people who are not from around here, who are kind of getting involved with the podcast stuff. I'm just really liking that. Um, it's just a nice mix of like, you know, it's just fun to get different perspectives and I, I'm just, I'm just really digging it and it's cool. And, um, and, and, you know, we might try to start having like people on the podcast who are not us at some point, um, in the future. Uh, that, that frightens me yeah. <laughs> know, like a little bit. Yeah. It kind of does me too. But, um, because yeah, no, we're insular, Dan. That's the problem. Like we're just, yeah. We're all about it's it's it's. I'm not saying it's. I think it's a good thing. I think it's a strength in its way. But uh, so I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's all things that I'm thinking about, and um, it's pretty exciting. Have you searched for 
uh, you know, gaming meetups or groups or whatever in the vicinity of where you, you're moving to? No, I'll just make one. Are there any that you could yeah. like, assume leadership of? Just overthrow I, I could, yeah, the well, leader? I mean, I'll, and... I'll look, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll kind of sniff around, like, see if the pack alpha is weak, right. uh, whether yeah. they, I can take them down or not. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is one of my my personal strengths is I execute and I do it right. And like, so if I can find a group that's flagging a little bit, like the gauntlet was when I found the gauntlet, you will execute them. I will, I will, <laughs> I will execute. Um, I mean, I, mean I, that's the thing. I'm, but, but no, I think I'm going to just do like gauntlet, New Jersey. So All right. okay. yeah, have a little, a little, a little tiny branch over there. Unless, unless the hangouts thing continues to be a success. I mean, once I move to New Jersey, I'm going to take over more of that. Like, I think I'm going to try to run a midweek game in addition to my Saturday morning cartoon thing. So. Um, you know, I might go majority of my gaming might be done through Hangouts and it'll be a great chance to to keep in touch with you guys too if you want to join me on Hangouts because that's one of the great sadnesses of leaving Houston is I really, really hate the fact that I won't be able to game with you guys yeah. Yeah. in we're, person. We're really going to miss you. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. And maybe if you yeah, play some online so games at a time other than 8 a.m. on a Saturday. <laughs> right. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you guys wouldn't get up at 8 a.m. on a Saturday for me? Uh, in fairness, I, I probably would. But okay, I work that's on good. Saturdays. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, one other thing is if you get a VR headset, we can all play in VR. There was last weekend. There was a That's big cool. VR yeah. meetup where they have a virtual table. And I can like, get, in, I get into that. I can get into on that the virtual table. Yeah, it'd be pretty badass. It'd be badass. One of these options is cheaper than the other, though. It's That's true. Yes. yes. Which one of you? Is one go- of them is awesome. Which yeah. one of you? Which <laughs> one of you is going to do the Joel from Last of Us 3D model? Um, <laughs> or the or the naked werewolf? Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I can I mean, role play those. Things. I, right. I cannot. Not I, I can't like them 3D digitally. model them. So I mean, I could make a cylinder, and you could just fill in the <laughs> fill in the blanks in your mind. Do some visual it. mind's eye I love theater. It. I love it. Uh, awesome. Let's go to the next segment. So our main topic today is kind of a heavy one. We are probably not going to do it justice in the amount of time we have, but let me just talk about what the lead up to it was and what my, where my, you know, what my thought process was. So Mark Diaz Truman uh, has a game coming out uh, that he's uh, in the middle of, I think it's in Ashcan right now, which I guess is like a pre beta or something like that. He had it out at Gen Con. He was selling copies of the, uh, of the Ashcan at Gen Con. It's called Cartel and it involves, uh, it's a PBTA game in which you play various operatives of a Mexican drug cartel. When I was thumbing through the playbooks, you know, because the playbooks are freely available, I was thumbing through the playbooks and I got this really, I don't know, I, I just got a really bad feeling about it. Like it seemed like it just maybe was like glorifying these, these people. <laughs> um, and, and I kind of took it a little hard just in the sense that in my legal practice, listeners don't know this, but in my legal practice, you know, several years ago, I was very, very heavily into doing work for indigent uh, clients from Mexico, most of whom were affected uh, in really, really terrible ways by the drug trade. And, and, and we're talking really barbaric, horrific stuff, right? And so I was just a little uh, put off because just from a reading of the playbooks, it didn't seem like the issue was being treated with like a, the gravity that I thought it should be, you know? And, um, so I kind of said something about it. Uh, he was very gracious and, uh, and, and, and put a, uh, and replied to me at, at length, um, with, you know, what his goals were and his intentions with the game. And I totally believe him. And I, and I really want to read the full text of the game at some point, um, just to see kind of what, you know, cause I was just getting the playbooks. I wasn't getting the whole, the whole text. And so I don't know exactly how he's approached, you know, the, the subject, but anyway, the whole, uh, what, when this was all going on, I just, it kind of inspired me. I was, I've been thinking about these two big questions as a result of this. And, uh, the first is when a game designer is doing a really tough subject like this, you know, and, and just as example of other subjects that might be, you know, hard to deal with, like, you know, things dealing with, say, sexual predation or marginalized communities or social inequality, that kind of thing, right? Does the game designer owe the consumer anything in terms of like how they approach the material, you know, or, or, or what do they owe the, the their, 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 their players, uh, to make sure that they are experiencing the game with the right, uh, frame of mind and context, you know, and, and are not just going to fall back on playing like tropes or whatever, you know? Yeah. And the other question was, what do we, uh, and I say we as like the gauntlet, like what do we as organizers of games like owe to the players when we're bringing something like that to the table? And, uh, so that's kind of where I wanted to go with it. 
I'm not going to harp on cartel. <laughs> I totally take uh, the author at his word that, that, you know, his intentions were good with it. Uh, I was just a little put off by it and I'm anxious to see the full text just to see how it kind of shapes up. So anyway, that's kind of where I wanted to start. And so I guess before we kind of dive into the, those two questions, I would like to ask the both of you, do you think role-playing games are art? <laughs> <laughs> Just an easy soft, a softball one to get started. So, is this the softball? This yeah. is the softball okay. question. I might not, I might not be a, uh, the the right guy for hardball. <laughs> um, I'm just stalling so I can pull up the right part of my, oh, good, my text good. here. Go ahead. Uh, in that case, I will say basically, whenever whenever somebody says something along the lines of "is X art," that's when I check out and let me, and I'm like, don't care. Oh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, oh, really? Pulled up now. Yeah. <laughs> So you, so you don't have any opinion on whether you think? No, I think it's definitely art, and I don't give a shit if you don't. Oh, so. okay. What you, is that your opinion too? <laughs> I, uh, but like, it's a meaningless distinction. Yeah, is yeah. my point. Like, I, I, don't, yeah, I don't care enough about the extremes. Right? That's, yeah, that's fair. Like, yeah. To me, it's art. But if you don't think so, great. Well, so let me put a finer point on it then. A thing that happens in video games a lot. You know, this like our video games art thing has been, you know, that's been a discussion at some like, I actually have no opinion on whether they're art or not. I'm sure they are. I don't think about it much. Uh, I think I just have no opinion on it, honestly. But one thing that I think is interesting that happens in the video game community is people in the video game community, there's this desire. I think it's probably near being passed, but like for a long time, there was this desire for video games to be treated seriously, much like films and fine art, right? Right. Like there was this big desire for that. But that desire, <laughs> that desire, like that, 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 uh, that anxiousness to be like considered like, you know, serious, you know, and, and be, to be regarded in that way stops with a lot of gamers right at the point where the subject of the game gets to be very touchy or difficult. Oh, yeah, that's true. And suddenly they fall back into games are just meant to be fun. Right. And so that is a, that's a thing you see all the time in video game communities, right? Like, Video, you know, like, like video games are art. Like we have to take video games seriously. They're, they're equal to movies and da, 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 da. Oh, but stop, you know, like video games are just supposed to be fun. I don't want to play your video game about like, you know, I don't want to play your video game about like, you know, about depression, about depression. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. You see what I'm saying? Like, so, uh, and I think I'm trying to like see if like, if there's something, if there's like a conversation like that in role playing games, like, do you think that's a thing in role playing games? Cause you know, honestly, like we don't play many of these like tougher subject games, right? We mostly play the fun games, you know? Uh, sure. that's just kind of how we've, you know, but mostly because of the public nature of our group, uh, we kind of have to play those games just because it's the easiest thing to get to the table. But, uh, you know, but it's not like we don't, we don't touch them at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, I, absolutely not. I mean, we definitely do play them on occasion. Um, so anyway, I just wanted that. I think that's more what I meant. Like not our role playing games art, but rather, do you think that that tension exists in role playing games? I think it's sort of unavoidable with, Anything that, like you were saying, wants to be taken seriously, right, and is also also tends to be fun, right, right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I I, th- I think this was this is an age old enough debate that I I believe this was present at the onset of movies becoming a big thing, right? Uh, movies are just uh, entertainment, entertainment, no, are yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I I th- I know here here's part of me not caring about the art debate at least, but right, yeah, yeah. I think I think RPGs addressing uh, serious subject matter. While certainly optional, I, I, some games I don't, I don't want to deal with that every time I sit down, right? But I think it's, I think it's an important thing to experience. Okay. Like, okay. Last night I was, uh, wasting my time. I really do mean that on Reddit's slash RPG forum, right? The, the place is a cesspool. Don't go there. <laughs> all of Reddit. Yeah. All of yeah. Reddit. Yeah. And, uh, somebody, uh, I was, I was about to reply to somebody's post from a few days ago about what do you consider to be, uh, essential games to play. And I realized it was a couple days old. And if I replied, one person would read it and who cares? But I was thinking about it for a while and I was sort of going through the list of games I've played and coming up with games that I thought were mechanically significant or that represented interesting, different ways to do things or the pinnacle of a way to do things or something like that. Right. And I, after I got my list done, I realized there was something missing. And what was missing was uh, and I've only played a few games like this, but what was missing was something like Grey Ranks or Night Witches or oh. the game that attacks uh, serious subject matter in a serious way. 
Right. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's important for people to the dog eat dogs of the world. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My only experience with that was when we were playing in a Chuck E. Cheese analog. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, that, I, th- that lessened the impact. Of yeah. The this right, this right, conversation yeah. is being led by the person who took a very, very serious game like dog eat dog about <laughs> cl- the horrors of colonialism and put it in a fucking Chuck E. Cheese's. So right. Caveat everything that's about to come out of my mouth. So listeners. I still have that on my potential <laughs> list. But, you know, asterisk. I, haven't played it. Right, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But I think it's a. Uh, I, I can understand different sides of this, but I think the default is that people should at least give something like this a shot. Where you sit down, and I think I'm I'm sort of going to maybe contradict something you will will bring up later that we have in. in no, notes go for it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. But I think it's important to sit down and maybe have the tone conversation about like, okay, this is about child soldiers in. Uh, occupied Poland, Poland during World War right, II, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and terrible things are going to be happen. So right, yeah. uh, are going to get going to be happening. So, uh, you know, a serious tone, and at least experience that a few times in your uh, uh, in your role playing career. L- let's get the community in here because I decided to get the community involved in this one uh, before we before we did the recording because I, I like to I always like to hear what the community has to say. One of our listeners who is uh, who is a game designer, uh, Ray Otis, he says, I think RPGs are a great medium for this kind of exploration, meaning exploration of like very serious subject matter. Yeah. Right. Um, but you have to but you have to have buy in from everyone at the table. I'm not saying everyone has to be supercharged to jump on the topic. I simply mean they have to be up for it and in the mood to tackle something more serious. Role playing games are, after all, a game and there is an implied lightheartedness to them. In my opinion, a good analogy is movies. Like you kind of like you said earlier, movies are explicitly entertainment. He puts that in quotes. It's true that sometimes you feel like watching a challenging movie, one that will intellectually provoke you or give you or give you deeper and more complex feelings to work out. But a lot of the time you just want to be entertained. You can't pick out the first type of movie and bring it home to your lover, family or friends without checking in with them first. Otherwise, you may be watching it alone or worse, watching it with someone who's miserable but humoring you. Uh, Dragging your friends through a similarly weighty role playing game without appropriately gauging their interest is going to produce a sour experience. I have a thought about that. You know, my thinking, I, I think Ray is, is, is right. I mean, I, I think that's a terrific thought, but my immediate thought when I read that was, aren't you always just letting people off the hook by doing that? Cause nobody wants to play that game, right? Instinctively. Don't you think? Uh, oh, I, I don't think so at all. No, you I don't, don't either. So? No, I think that I do sometimes. It's sort of a natural, game. I feel yeah. like. If well, you're curious do, enough about the yeah. about games in general, yeah. then like you're naturally going to find these games and want to play them. So yeah, and I, I, if you're I, I not, agree. then I don't know. I don't. I don't feel that we need to like foist them onto people. Yeah. So maybe uh, part of it's maybe we're thinking of different things because like my you know thought process immediately goes to the sort of heavier stuff I have played, which like which is like gray ranks and, you know, it's a terrible subject matter. But sure, I wouldn't want yeah. to sit somebody down at a table to play gray ranks. Right. Uh, and the only thing I've told them is like, oh yeah, it's a uh, World War Two. We'll be fighting Nazis. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because those are mm, different different implications. But in, so in I think about thing. the way we organize games, right? I have put some things on the calendar before. My life with Master sticks out as one. Uh Doggy Dog is another, gray, gray ranks for that matter. I've I've stuck some games on the calendar where I kind of don't in the description I don't really go through a lot of the, you know, what are you getting when you come to this event, right? And, you know, you know, if they show up and I, am I just supposed to say, hey, this game is going to be about this game is about abusive relationships and you're probably going to feel <laughs> super uncomfortable about it. Do you want to go home now? I mean, you know, <laughs> like, you know, but, but, so they were getting a surprise, but I, but they liked it. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, so I don't know. I mean, I'm not. Yes. I, I clearly, obviously, you need to make sure everybody's on board with what you're doing. But part of me feels like that we're probably more adventurous or exploratory than than a lot of people. And there are a lot of people out there who could stand to have their their bubble burst a little bit without, you know. Non consensually, so to speak. That, that sounds terrible. <laughs> this is getting real rapey. Yeah, that's yeah. not how I meant that at all. That, I mean, that's that's not that's totally not what I meant. Um, it just came off really really bad. So anyway, uh, I don't know. I don't think I have much more to say about that. But I just thought it was an interesting. You know, the, the premise of the conversation to me is like, you know, should role playing games can role playing games or should role playing games even touch these subjects? And if and if you are going to touch these tougher subjects, what do game designers owe the players? Uh, both mechanically and in terms of setting and what do organizers owe their players in terms of like preparing them for what's about to come. Right. So why don't we move on to that? Because what I truly want to talk about is should we expect things from game designers who take on these subjects? Like clearly I had an expectation that Mark Diaz Truman was going to treat 
this subject that I have a lot of personal connection to mm-hmm. in a certain way, right? But he didn't write the game for me specifically. So, you know, who the fuck am I to, <laughs> you know, to like have that expectation, right? I mean, so I don't know. Um, I liked a lot of what uh, we had a couple of game designers chime in on that question. Marshall Miller chimed in. Uh, you guys will know him from, uh, uh, well, recently the Warren, which is coming out soon and I'm very excited about. So he says games are a really good way to address a wide variety of topics, even heavy ones. If you're going to include a heavy topic, address that topic intentionally. I think he means like designers, right? Address that topic intentionally. Your game will say something about it regardless. So don't just use it to move the plot along or to decorate the setting because that will only speak to normalcy or acceptance. And whether fair or not, I think that's what I interpreted cartel as as Mm. taking this really, really bloody, horrific, like, thing that's happening right now in our world and using it as set dressing for Grand Theft Auto, the RPG, right? That was kind of what I, where I was coming with that. He also says, you know, show your game to lots of people. It's so easy when you're slogging through the umpteenth revision of a text to leave things out uh, only to read it a year later and realize that all the smart thoughts and good intentions that were swirling in your head never got explicitly called out in the actual text. Even if they're an emergent part of play, a reader can't be expected to glean that result from a cold read. Uh, you want people to point out those gaps along the way so that you can fill them in before you go to print. That seems reasonable to me. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. that's just solid advice in general. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure. And then another game designer, Paul Sega, uh, who's done My Life with Master, some very challenging games in his time, including My Life with Master and Nicotine Girls. Uh, he says, my belief is that you have to allow for art to challenge your comfort zone. That's pretty much what art is all about. Um, changing society to getting, uh, by getting under people's hardened beliefs. Um, it's threatening by definition. He says, but then stuff like Jenny Jones or the Jerry Springer show, that, that's not art. So I think you need to look at a game and decide if it has an artistic purpose for its heavy subject matter. Uh, Nicotine Girls, that's one of his games. Uh, Nicotine Girls does. It has something to say. It's not just lurid voyeurism. And this is what he said that really, really stuck out to me. Uh, with RPGs, maybe it's a little harder. A designer with no particular artistic purpose could believe that players will bring artistic purpose to the play experience. Uh, this is important, heavy stuff, and people will be drawn to it because it gives them a platform to express something important. He's saying, like, players will just naturally, like, bring, yeah. bring the importance to their the play, right? will be emergent. It will yeah. be emergent, right? But he's saying he doesn't, he doesn't buy it. He says, I tend to doubt it. I think mostly what you get is reiteration of known tropes. So I don't design that way. I like that a lot. Because one of the things that sticks out to me about, uh, let's say, My Life with Master, for example, the way you engage with that game's mechanics, you can't help but learn the lesson and feel something, right? Yeah. Like, like it's unavoidable. It's unavoidably right. so, sure. right? Same thing with Dog Eat Dog. You can, you're going to feel like a powerless – the mechanics force you to feel like a powerless native in right, the face right. of this horror, right? You're going to learn the lesson. Thoughts? I like the point a lot. I have a bunch of things swirling around, so I'm not just replying to this. Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, S- say them. <laughs> <laughs> say your thoughts. <laughs> uh, the so, sort of going back to what a game designer owes to uh, to it uh, to his or her players. I think that a heavier subject matter does mean that the game designer owes, hmm, especially especially a more present one, a more current one. Right, yeah. Like, cause there, there's a long story tradition of, uh, pulp fiction and pulp, uh, f- uh, games. Mobster games, Nazi games, Having all Nazis that stuff. To right, punch them, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, then, uh, you know, not really dealing with what the Nazis The issues, yeah. right, yeah. And, I don't know. I don't know if that gets a pass or not, but I think that something like, uh, I keep going to rare ranks, but I mean, it is pretty, pretty freaking heavy. It's heavy. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. I mean, it's, it's a real tough game. It's, yeah children and genocide and Nazis and it's all sorts of horrible things. But I think that if that had been handled uh, a little more frivol- frivolously, it would have been uh, a disaster. It would have been, yeah. I, I, th- I think that Jason Morningstar who designed gray ranks realized that he owes that subject matter, a serious treatment. And he, right. Uh, you know, he, he owed it the research and the, uh, and, and the sort of dissemination of what, that those events, those series of events in that time period meant to the people involved and the people affected by it. Right. And I think he, you know, I think he delivered that. And I think that a, a game with a more serious subject matter does sort of require that, that sort of thing. I agree. And yeah. I, maybe, maybe a super talented person could get around it. And I'm not that person. So I'm not sure how you'd manage to turn it into the awesome exploitation movie or whatever. Right. Uh, yeah. Without it yeah. also yeah. being super, yeah. super problematic. I mean, I guess you could probably, I could see gray ranks without all that context and without some of the, the little mechanical tricks that the game does. I could see 
you may be running gray ranks in a sort of like Red Dawn or Inglorious Bastards kind of yeah. like action adventure war thing. Uh, that would be shitty though. Yeah. <laughs> shitty and kind of pointless, right? So do you well, got- so let's talk about that. Cause I think that's the main point is that like, I don't know. It makes me really uncomfortable to say that like anyone who's engaging in the creative process and creating this thing owes anyone shit. That makes me really uncomfortable to okay. say. So I would be much more comfortable just saying that like, don't expect it to be good if you don't put the care into these subjects right, as yeah. you would. But mm. like, I don't know. I don't, maybe yeah, uh, it's, maybe it's my oh, privilege speaking a, here, a but like, yeah. I don't know if the cartel was nothing but like literally GTA in Mexico. I mean, he could, he should still be able to make it. Oh yeah, I probably yeah. wouldn't play it. I probably wouldn't, like, yeah, I wouldn't play that game. I mean, I just I'm not because advocating, my, you know, just because my censoring pers- people, yeah, yeah, right? But yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah I'd like this censorship. But, but this conversation tends to like read like that on some level. I think like that always gets under my skin when I hear mm-hmm. people say that like mm-hmm. that people shouldn't make things like this and they should make things like this. Right. So, like, I mean, I don't think that's what we're saying though. I mean, I think we're just saying like in terms of you know if if your goal. If your goal in, a, in a, what I'm saying is, if your goal in a design is to express, let's the horrors of of the Nazi occupation of Poland, or if your goal is to express the horrors of 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 colonialism on the Philippine, you know, on the Philippine Islands, if that's your goal, at what do you owe the player to make sure that they hit that goal? In okay, their, sure. does that yeah. make that's 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 what I'm saying, like. People could go make whatever games they want, right? right I don't yeah. have to play them, <laughs> right? Like, exactly, like, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't have to play them. Like, like if it, like the cartel game, I, I think my instinct, without knowing much, I mean, I, I've played, I've played a number of Mark Diaz Truman's games, but like, and my instinct was that he had good intentions for it, and I think that's why I responded the way I did because I don't think his, I didn't think his intentions were bad. I thought his intentions were good, and I was a little like surprised and disappointed because my reading of it was that it wasn't a. Tr- mm-hmm. a serious treatment of it right and i and and so i i think what i'm what yeah so like if i think if if you're as a game designer if your goal is to like is to explicitly deal with these subjects and to help your players you know to make the players of your game like experience something in a certain way then what do you owe the players that's sure, that's what yeah. i'm getting at so so, so like less a, less a moral imperative than a how do you yeah, that's uh, what I'm getting at. Yeah, best absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah, practices. Best practices yeah. I feel yeah. like is a much better way. Well, to sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, all the listeners got to this part where we clarified what we we're talking about <laughs> before they turned it off. Um, you know, look, I, I guess like the sort of like next question then is: Is it enough to just go through the historical setting and the background, or like to go through, you know, to go through the literature and the preface of the book, or to, or to, you know, and and then just to have just a, a sort of a, a game that kind of runs like any other role-playing game you know like you do a bunch of the historical work and then it's just a d20 or GURPS thing you know like is that sufficient well, or should the mechanics i mean that's what paul's point was, that was right? exactly that's yeah, what paul's is point that was that's not sufficient if your goal is to actually like get this right. experience across then you yeah. need to yeah. reinforce it through mechanics right you yeah. can't just rely on the players to like do the legwork themselves right yeah. to actually yeah. make this thing come alive in the right way right yeah yeah Hey, this uh, this conversation could maybe substitute for my weekly uh, Reddit slash RPG does system matter argument, um, <laughs> or 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 not. We could just skip past that because I think we yeah, I think I think we all agree with what the yeah, yeah yeah we, we we definitely do. Let's just go to the next thing then. Like, what do we owe our players if we're organizing games? Okay, if we're gonna do if we're gonna do something. So, can, can I just the anecdote here? I put my life with master on the calendar before I realized how it was going to go right like right. i i didn't know how it was going to be like i read the rules but it's got like kind of goofy cartoon art in it you know and and i think that i dropped my guard a little bit on like what the game was about <laughs> and i i got I dropped my guard a little bit on what the game was about and i had a full <laughs> table of people and suddenly this game is going into territory that i didn't initially anticipate yeah, right? right and i i anticipated i i i caught on pretty quick and we, we were doing a multiple session thing, so I, I kind of tried to make sure that everyone was on board with how it was going and, and whether they wanted to proceed. But uh, so that's my anecdote. I felt for a, a really, really like for a sliver of time right there, I felt really, really vulnerable in terms of like being a responsible organizer of games. 
you know, like I felt, I felt a little like, oh shit, like this was not like, <laughs> right, oh yeah. shit, I sold this as art deco 1920s horror movie, you know, like thing or right. whatever, right? Like, like I sold it as that and um, it ended up being something it's quite like different. It's like wacky Dracula. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, mean, yeah I, just, I sold it as a certain thing in the, you know, in like in the banner image I used and everything. I sold it a certain right. way and it, and it didn't, it wasn't that, right? Yeah. So anyway, I, that's just, I just want to kind of throw that out there to say that like, this is not some theoretical problem, right? Right. Like, sure. <laughs> like this is definitely not some theoretical problem. Problem. Yeah, I, I think a certain amount of that is probably unavoidable when one is uh, right, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, trying to condense a game and sell it to a broad audience. Right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, so uh, part of why I would advocate generally for trying to let people know what they're getting into is uh, also an anecdote on my end. So my my friend Sean, when we were discussing which games he might like to play, told me that he doesn't really want to play any game that doesn't involve magic or some sort of fantasy element or a, a prominent like science fiction element. And that's because in his day job, he dealt with horrible real world tragic things, basically. And he just wants to come home and toss some dice and have an, have an escape. Sure. I'm not, sh- I'm not sure he would want to avoid s- serious subject matter necessarily, but there's a certain amount of definite escapism that has to be there. Right. right? Yeah. And I mean, I, I can't fault the guy for that. I don't, I, I don't have similar circumstances and I'm perfectly fine with pursuing the, the gut punch experience in a game. Right. Right. Yeah. But I understand where he's coming from. He doesn't, he doesn't want to deal with yeah. more crap t- piled on right. top of crap. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it, um, listener, uh, one of our listeners who chimes in a lot, uh, listener Colin, he's got some really utilitarian, utilitarian advice here. Uh, he says, uh, some tabletop people use the X card and lines and veils to set up safe space for gaming. Uh, just a refresher. The X card is like a card that's on the table you can grab if somebody does something that is uncomfortable for you and no one can judge you for grabbing the card. Like it's a, it's a right. social contract thing where like, Whatever was just said that that bothered you and disturbed you, it's we excise it, right? Um, lines and veils is a similar thing, right? He goes um, about setting boundaries, right? Uh, he says, I personally like to use the LARP rules of cut and break instead of the X card for my games. Um, he says, either of these techniques are useful for dealing with heavier topics, since when people know there is a way for them to say something isn't comfortable, then they often feel more comfortable uh, taking their character to a darker, more vulnerable place. If you aren't aware of these techniques, he recommends you check them out. I'm sure many of our listeners are. I have to say, uh, from recent experience, you should not skimp on this. We get, we are damn lazy about this in the gauntlet. Like we're really, really super fucking lazy about it. And I'm reminded how lazy we are about it on the <coughs> rare instance when we have a brand new player, right? <laughs> like, like I mean, we have a lot of brand new players, but like, but, but, but on the rare instance when we have a brand new player that shows up to a game that we're accustomed to playing a certain way, right? Right. I'm thinking of the final girls. I'm thinking of fiasco. I'm thinking of uh, games where, you know, we all are very comfortable with each other. We right. understand each other's, right, right. <laughs> you know, like the way, what we can get away with, with, with each other. And, I'm acutely aware of what's about to happen when certain people are at the table. You know, I'm acutely aware of it. And there's a new person there. And I'm just thinking like, I'm just, I've just got like, like, it's like egg crushing over my head or like, or like, like, I I feel like a crushing melting sensation of holy fuck. I totally know what's about to happen right now. And there's this brand new person. What the fuck are they going to think? And that's when I know I fucked up. Yeah. That's when I know I fucked up. Like, I fucked up because I did not have the tone conversation. Uh, we were so bad about that, even though we know not to. And that doesn't even have anything to do with uncomfortable play. That's just, you yeah. know, just good role playing. And then we did not have a conversation about like, Hey, this is the territory this might go into. Is there anything that you want to, you know, put on the no list? Right. Like, is there something you, that you don't want to cross? I'm so fucking lazy about it and it's and i have those reminders every now and then and i'm still fucking lazy about it but it's not excusable but it's just it's just to say that like when you game as much as we do and you have like in particular we have about a core group of about 15 to 20 people when you have that core group of people who you play with a lot it's so easy to get lazy about this yeah uh, I'd like to read just a couple more things that some of our listeners uh, chimed in on the, in the community. Listener Philip said, I, I really liked what he, had, what he had to say. It kind of goes back to a little bit about game design goals. But he says, um, the author of the core text and maybe the facil- facilitator of the game, in my opinion, have some responsibility to give some advice 
uh, on how to handle the material and actually play it, um, assuming it is actually meant to be played. Um, I think he's <laughs> making a little reference to games that are uh, earlier. He had a bigger comment where he basically said, like, a lot of games he feels like are just game designers getting their issues out and maybe the games aren't meant to be played anyway yeah, that's fair i right? could see that right yeah i could think i could think of a few of those mistakes are bound to happen and should be excusable especially at the table a little less with an actual commercial product um he says i would see a need for some techniques uh and advice and handling whatever material whatever the game material is about he says it can be ingrained in the mechanics and dynamic dynamics of play or it can just be advice uh he says for example the queer content chapter in monster hearts giving some context to the mechanics is an example that comes to mind and is actually helpful in understanding how the game is played and what is to be expected. The mechanics alone would not have related that. That's a great, great example, actually, yeah. of um, you, where, you, where you have both, right? Like the mechanics lead to this result. Like the, the mechanics help, like force you to like to, to to like operate in a queer space. And but there's also like a nice part of the book that kind of yeah. that explains it, you know, that, that right. points that out because point, if you just skim over the move, yeah, you, you might not, you, might not you may not catch click. all that, right? And, and you, you might, and in fact, you might like go to like what Paul said, you would go to the tropes where you would just like, like, oh, well, turn someone on. Clearly, that means turn turn her on because I'm a because I'm a boy and she's a girl, right, you right, know, right? Yeah. I mean, turn someone on of the opposite of sex. the opposite sex, <laughs> yeah. So you, you would That's implied, right? yeah, you would, yeah, you would automatically put that parenthetical on there, right? Yeah, so. Uh, I, I think Monster Hearts is probably one of the really shining examples of like uh, how you can really deftly deal with a serious subject, but in a way that's also fun and yeah, uh, yeah. And, and and really and also mechanically like mechan- it's not just f- for lack of a better word. It's not just like, you know, like just just fluff or context like in the text. It's it's an actual right like mechanical reinforcement of it. So this, this will come up because someone will use will use this move. Yeah, right? Right. It will yeah, turn you on. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know. That was a good conversation. Uh, I, I, do you guys have anything else you want to say about it? I mean, you know, I, I sometimes wish we would play games with tougher subjects. Like there, I see games out there sometimes where I think, oh, that's really, that's really like razor sharp. Like I, I want to have a game about that, but I just think that like, I kind of think that like nobody would be interested in playing them, but apparently I'm wrong. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you got, you got two of us. I, right I, think, I think a lot of people would just be like, I'm not going to that. So I think they, like I said, I think they only came to my life with bastard because I <laughs> fucked it up. Like I'm serious. <laughs> now they all had a good time once they were there. We had it was a terrific session. Those two sessions of my life with Master are among my favorite I've ever had in role playing games. But you know, I don't think that game would have made if I had like been. This is a game about. Uh, this is a metaphor about abuse and abusive relationships. <laughs> like I don't, you know, like I don't think the game would have made I, that. I think there's some, you know, some middle ground between uh, car- cartoony imagery and. Uh uh, th- this is about every- everybody's a, uh, everybody's, Renfield. everybody's, everybody's, Renfield. Renfield. everybody's yeah. Renfield. Yeah. Um, I think there's some middle ground between that and, uh, b- being as on the nose as you, as you just <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Well, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, you're right. Like, I mean, this this yeah. is the game of, uh, you know, you, you are Renfield dealing with the, the fucked up relationship you have uh, with, with your, your master. With yeah. Your with master, the master. Right? Yeah. Yeah. There's some, yeah. there's some key words that you can yeah. toss in that don't yeah. mean you have to. Come right out and say everything, but still. Then you get to the table and you see that your primary stat is self-loathing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, you're right. It's, yeah. Well, okay. That was it. You guys have anything else you want to say? I mean. No, I, I just no. think, like, I like the phrase best practices. Right. I think best yeah. practices is treat the subject matter ideally with, uh, uh, with a certain amount of gravity and seriousness and try to convey that through me- mechanics and side text, like we were talking about with, uh, Monster Hearts to the players who are going to be responsible for disseminating it to right. the other players. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And as an organizer, maybe uh, make sure you understand the game before you put it on a <laughs> schedule. <laughs> but you, to be fair, wait, what I mean, was it? Oh wait. Oh, well, you it's mean, a lot oh, of reading. Okay. Right? Yeah, I mean, so. What? <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. <laughs> The, the game is literally like 30 pages long. Um, uh, no, it's Dan, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I, again, what I'm saying, <laughs> that's the See, theme. This is why that's I don't engage in these kinds that's of the theme uh, for tonight. conversations online. Uh, the, 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 the theme for tonight. Uh, no, um, I got the, from a read of the text, I got the thrust of what the goals of the game were. I just didn't know how sharply it was going to come out and play. Okay. Right. Mm. That like, it became really sharp in play. I was like, Oh shit. Like this is, like the players are really like genuinely bothered that they can't do anything about what 
the master's doing right now, and they have to like suck it up and take it. Like I haven't played this game. This sounds know. awesome. Oh, it, it, oh see, it, 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 I thought it was, and uh, and I think most of the players enjoyed it. But um, they were there were a couple of them that were clearly getting a brand new experience, mm-hmm. right? Like it was clear me, even even myself. Like I, I credit that game often with like kind of um, opening my eyes to what uh, to what a role playing game can accomplish. You know, but no, yeah, I definitely didn't like. I, but I, I think I'm more sensitive to it now, though, for sure. Yeah, sure. You know, like I I know what. Yeah, I'm, I'm more like, I think, I think that was a nice eye opening experience for me to where I could say, Hey, you know, let's think about what's going to actually happen at the table and whether people are going to be cool with this or not. So, so before we go out, I want to say that my greatest, um, wish is to completely violate this and play that game that I don't remember who designed it. Maybe like Willow Palachek or something, but it's a three player game. One, one player is like the GM character. One player is like, sunshine and one player is something else uh it's it's presented to the third character to the third player as a game like a romantic comedy where uh the where the sunshine character is like the quirky guy who's going to come in and like cheer up this this morose grumpy guy but the the two players who are in on it know that it's actually a game about a serial killer who's going to wow. murder that third character and that so, sounds good and so the that setup really for all good. of the scenes are like this is the the first scene is like the meeting and but like in the in the uh serial really killer good. manual yeah. it's called like the stalking or something <laughs> and there's like good. these there's yeah. these questions that are like you you ask sunshine like what quirky thing does the killer do that uh <laughs> that makes it hard yeah. for him to connect with other people that's so good <laughs> yeah. that's so good <laughs> it's really good yeah so good. i think it's called it's called sunshine or something about something along the lines i don't know i'll look it up but cool it's great cool that's pretty awesome yeah that sounds terrible and great yeah yes. yeah hey you guys doing three forged i am uh no no i'm on the fence i don't know you should do it how's yours going it sounds, it sounds oh wonderful. mine's done you're just done you've already submitted it yeah yeah i what? submitted it like two days in or they're something due, they're due the 11th right yes okay yeah so there's still when this episode goes out there'll be a couple days still to yeah. submit something yeah. which is all the time you need because it doesn't have to be a full game uh we, just, we should we should probably well since we should uh, yeah. l- listeners <laughs> right, so you yeah, know yeah, we're yeah, talking yeah. about what the hell this is uh, yeah um uh there's a contest that paul sega uh or not a, con- not a contest a, a game design i guess it's a contest right game jam type thing thing yeah mm. uh called three forged uh really cool concept the idea is you submit um a fairly short like you know idea for a role-playing game i think it's between what 700 and a thousand words or something like that uh yes. 1100 yeah, i think it's that that. Um, and then a second person gets your draft and they add to it. They, yes. they change and they add. like they like double the word count. Right. Essentially. Yeah. But they, they can also kind of edit anything you've written. Yeah. And then you give it that product to a third person who then uh, adds to it and deletes as as needed. And uh, all of these are random assignments. Right. As well. Yeah. Um, and uh, pretty cool, I think. And, and, and surprisingly, um, I. I've heard of a few other gauntlet members who are participating, uh, who are excited to participate because I think we're in that weird space as far as communities go where we play lots and lots of games, but none of us are game designers. And I think right. like we could use a little push. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a little push like towards game design because and uh, and so this is a nice way of doing it because you don't have to come up with your entire game. Yeah. You only have to come up with the core and does, let someone finish it for you. Uh, does each person do uh, each of those steps just for different games? Yeah. So you will yeah. touch three games okay. over the course of your of your participation. And the initial game that you submit will be like edited by two other people right, as well. Right. OK, so are we allowed to say what the games are about? Uh, we shouldn't because it's an it's anonymous. Oh, okay. So, All right. And if someone gets like my game, then they would know oh, yeah. if they yeah. heard it on the cast. So. Mm. Have you already done all three of your phases? No. So they're they're staggered. Oh, so oh, okay. the first right. phase ends on August 11th, and then they're all collected and randomly distributed. If you're going to participate, I don't know. I'm sure we'll have it in show notes, right? Yeah. If you're but, listening right now and you want to participate, and you're listening on Friday, <laughs> right? Uh, you've got what four days or whatever, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So. So email Paul and get a number. You get a number. He sends you. Yeah, yeah. So okay, yeah. I'm. I'm I think I'm gonna do it. I've got a. I've got an idea. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool. I was. I was got like, an idea. My- shockingly surprised by how easy it was to yeah. do when you could just leave big parts blank. <laughs> <laughs> are uh, Are there design constraints or you know seeds or no. something? No, I don't different? think so. No. no. I, one of the things that uh, you know, one of our members. We were ch- ch- chatting about it uh, a few days ago, and one of the things that came up was, um, like, 
what constitutes the core of the game or like what do you have to actually produce initially and i don't think there are any rules no, there's for no it. rules there's no that's, rules you can that's just kind of kind of the purpose yeah. is, you know whatever you feel is important right put, yeah write a thousand words about it and then <laughs> hope for <laughs> the best so, i'm yeah. gonna do it yeah i've got i've got an idea that i think uh, it's a for, it's for a game i would like to play so yeah yeah um cool awesome well uh that was a good good show um i <laughs> want to say to the listeners if you would like to reach us you may do so um uh, the best place is google plus we have a community on google plus called the gauntlet um we also have gauntlet hangouts which is if you'd like to come game with us uh, online you can uh, possibly find something there um, we, if you want to join us in Houston, we have a meetup. Uh, we haven't, we haven't mentioned that in a while. So figure, yeah. go ahead and mention that if you're going to be in Houston randomly, uh, go to our meetup page. Or uh, not randomly. If you have a non-random purpose for being, for in, being Houston. in Houston. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> a good point. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, Houston, people do often end up randomly in Houston. That's it. Right. Do you I have anything that's else? It. That's all we got. Okay. Uh, we don't do the email anymore. No, we don't. It's to see when we have these gaps in recording, Dan, I'm, I lose my mojo on this. Like it's true. these, I, I lose it. I forget how to get here. It's true. true. That's yeah. true. That'd forget cool. to say my name is in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, uh, thanks for joining us, Steve. Oh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Dan, uh, for uh, perfectly understanding everything I said tonight. Like always. <laughs> well, and, and, and thank, and thank me for, for expressing it obviously very clearly so that you would understand yeah. it so uh thank, you should thank me for playing the part of the of the rube who just doesn't get it <laughs> <laughs> no 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 i'm glad you spoke up because that was me uh, improving. well no I'm, I'm, I'm glad you spoke up because i could tell that i could feel i could feel your tension over here while we were talking about that and i could i could feel your tension and then they don't owe you anything exactly, what are you talking right? and about then, and, then when you, and then when you screamed at us and said that they don't know us shit that's when i knew oh wait we need to clarify what we're talking about. So, all right, cool. Uh, thanks, listeners. Have a good one. We were talking about this the other day. I was like, I was like, if you could just be like bopping around L.A. and drinking a smoothie with a celebrity, who would it be? And I was, I chose Lisa Kudrow. We could go like look at table linens together. <laughs> we could drink smoothies and look at table linens. It'd be amazing.